Hello friends, I am Saket. I welcome you all to our webinar series where we at Discuss Agile Network try to bring new topics and today we have a topic which is quite interesting. It's about managers, managers, uh, what they can do in an agile world and it is about management uh, 3.0. We have Ralph with us and uh, he will take us through the management 3.0 journey and uh, I will invite him first to start with his introduction and then an introduction of management 3.0. Ralph, up to you. Yes. Thank you very much for inviting me to uh, share my uh, management 3.0. Uh, my name is Ralph Roosmalen. Ralph Roosmalen, I'm from the Netherlands. And I'm a management 3.0 facilitator. Uh, furthermore, I'm uh, an agile coach, uh, specialized in distributed software development. And I've been in IT since 1997. I had many roles like a software developer, tester, test manager, project manager, um, etc. And since a year, I started my own company, being self-employed and uh, trying to teach people about Manage 3.0. You can read more. You can read more about it on my website or on my LinkedIn profile. Uh, what I would like to do today with you is take the two-day training of Manage 3.0 and condense it into one. 45 minutes, so it will be uh, fast paced. Uh, I'm just going to touch a few topics that we're going to dis normally discuss during the management 3.0 training. Um, if you have questions, then we will answer them at the end. Um, for management 3.0, where what is it about? It's about uh, officially transforming organizations into great places to work. Where people are engaged, work is improved, and clients are delighted. It's based on a book written by Jurek Apollo in 2011, uh, and this is maybe a bit of a technical explanation. And I always try to use a bit more common words so I can explain it also to my kids and to my grandmother of 94. And in the end, is make sure that everybody's happy at work, that all people really care about the things that they do, and they're constantly looking for improvement. What can we make? What can we do better today? And in the end, delight make the customer happy, but not only the customer, also the internal stakeholders. And it's not only responsibility of management, the manager, everybody should be involved in trying to realize that. That's for me in very common words what the management 3.0 is about. It's about managing the system, not the people. And uh, if you hear about management 3.0, you could wonder is there management 1.0? And yes, there is. Management 1.0 is in invented in the 20th century and was really there for factories where people. Uh, disconnected the thinking and the control because people were considered as machines. And it makes sense because it was also developed by engineers and it was developed for very predictable, predictable work. I mean, working in a factory where always you have to do the same things. But for innovation work, a lot of things that we do today, uh, software development uh, projects, it doesn't work like that. You can't uh, separate the mind from the from the activities. You need to connect them together. And thank God, many people realize that. Um, so management 2.0 is about people. Management realized that people are the most valuable asset, and that managers are more facilitators or servant leaders, as they also are called. But still, in management 2.0, management still use hierarchy. I mean, the ideas are good, but it doesn't work like that. I mean, it's like setting up an uh, HR system and then still be very not transparent. So what's management 3.0 all about? It's about thinking as a community, thinking as a city. <clears throat> if you look at a big city, uh, there's nobody in control. There's not one person in the city that controls everything. Everybody responsible for contributing to the success of the city. It's just the, the, the people who own shops, the people who are living there, the people who do uh, maintenance. It's everybody contributing to the success of the city to make it livable. Uh, livable. And what Peter Drucker says in his book, the management is about human beings. It's making people capable of joint performance. And management, as a verb, is important. He's not talking about managers, he's talking about management. And that's very important to realize in Management 3.0, that's our vision, that management is an activity, it's a verb. And it can be done without managers. It's a little bit like testing, software testing. You have a lot of companies who have dedicated software testers because they think quality is very important. But still, the whole development team is responsible for the quality, for the testing. It's not just a task of the testers. 
but it doesn't specialize in it. It's the same with management. Some companies don't have managers. I mean, startups, entrepreneurs, small companies, everybody manages everybody. And the bigger the company grows, people think, okay, we need to have some dedicated people who focus on management as a task. But still, everybody's responsible for management, not just the managers. So it's way too important, way too, yeah, every, too important to just leave it up to the managers. And the management's task is to grow, to nurture the system, to make sure that it works like that, that everybody can play the role of a manager, that everybody's responsible for it. That's what the managers should do. So management 3.0, is it a framework like Scrum or whatever? It's, it's a, collect, a collection of games, tools, ideas, um, to get this system up and running. And it's constantly evolving because people evolve, uh, environments evolve, uh, our ideas evolve. And that was one of the questions that uh, we asked in the last week. What is management treatment? Oh, is it an HR process used to manage people and organizations? No, it's not HR. Everybody's involved. Is the toolbox of tools? Yes, it is, partly. That the manager can use to manage departments with less resources, money, time? No, it's a toolbox of tools and much more that organizations can use to empower everybody to become a manager. So the best answer in this questionnaire was, is an ever changing collection of games, tools, and practice to help any worker to manage the organization? Management 3.0 exists out of six modules. Let's take a quick look at the different modules. Energize people. As we all know, people are the most important asset of the organization. So how do you get those people energized? How do you keep them motivated? How do you keep them active? How do you make sure that they keep being creative? That's one module where we talk about. The second one, if you get your people motivated, energized, it's about empowering teams. How do you make sure that the team self-organize? How do you make sure that teams take up responsibility? How do you make sure that teams don't take up too much responsibility in the area that they're not allowed to? So how do you build trust with those teams? That's what this empowering team is about. So the first step is about the individual, the second step is about the teams. So you got the teams up and running, you got motivated people, and then you got multiple teams self-organizing. But how do you make sure that it doesn't become chaos? How do you make sure that they all run in the same direction? That's what module online constraints about is the topic. Set goals, clear goals for the teams, for the people that they can contribute to to make sure that they all know where to go. The fourth one is about developed competence. I mean, we live in an economy, in a world that's constantly changing nowadays. I mean, who could 15 years ago predict how the world looks today? So imagine how it will look in seven years. So we need to develop competence. People need to develop competence. As a manager, it's your responsibility to help people with that. How do you develop competence in a creative organization? It's not that you can say to people, hey, you have to learn. No, you have to motivate them. So how do you do that? That's one of the modules, the fourth one. So the first one was about people, the second about teams, the third was about uh, second, the fourth is about <coughs> sorry, about aligning constraints. The fifth is about growth structure. How do you grow structure? Because teams work in a complex world, in a complex environment, they interact with a lot with other teams. Uh, teams are working distributed. How do you make sure that people are feel part of a team? That's the fifth module. And the last one is about improve everything. You got everything up and running. You got people who develop competence. You got people who are motivated. You got your teams aligned. You got you empowered. But how do you make sure that you keep improving? Because the world is changing so fast. Yes, how do you do that? It's easier said than done. That's what my three point is about. It's not about the people, it's about the system. For example, I once worked in a project in a company where we had test automations, Selenium, but not all testers were involved in test automation. So we could say to the testers, hey, you gotta learn about it, you need to spend time on it, but we did something different. We organized exploration days, one of the modules, one of the tools meant for 3.0, where we focused on learning, not about delivering. We valued what the people learned in those exploration days in those 24 hours. Some of the testers started working on Selenium, and they really liked it. And as a result, they kept doing this. Every third Thursday of the month, in the evening, we ordered pizzas for them, and they were working on Selenium. 
So we did not tell them to run Selenium, they took it up themselves. We managed the system, we created the situ situation, we created the opportunities, and they took it up. So management 3.0 is also about better management with few managers, because everybody has responsibility of managing, of making this happen. And now you probably wonder about management 4.0. Is there a management 4.0? I really don't know. Maybe there is, maybe there will be someday, but at the moment I don't think so. And on the other hand, if you constantly keep improving, then in the end we will end up with management 4.0, because it will change. This was a tricky question about the not. Which statement is not true? Just to explain to better management with few managers, Yes, that is true. That's what we will try to accomplish because we think that everybody should be manager. Managing the system, lots of people, absolutely true. That's what management 3.0 is about. The last one, management is too important to leave to the team members. Only managers should perform management tasks. That's not true. Management 3.0 believes that everybody should be involved in management, not only managers. Managers should create an environment where everybody can take up responsibility for management. That's how we think it should be. One of the things that we also discuss in Management 3.0 uh, a lot is about complexity thinking. <coughs> how do you look at the problem? How do you look at the world? <coughs> we tend to make things simple, uh, reduction defined. Um, so we got complex data and try to make it simple. And we as managers, we believe in that, the old fashioned manager and scientist, because they want to have clarity. So one of the things that they do when they see a complex situation, they think about numbers. They're going to make numbers and models for it, but they can calculate the things. And they forget about the people. But you can't calculate people, you can't work with numbers. It's, it's, it's people management. Another typical mistake that's happening is that people rely on instruction instead of communication. The more instructions we make, the more work checklists we make, the better it will go. No, it will help definitely, but communication is so important. Another typical mistake that you can make is try to control the future. Think that you can come up with a plan that will cover everything. The only reason that you make a plan, in my opinion, is to know where you deviate from. If you make a plan and you think that plan will be realistic, will be realized, I think we all know that plans don't work out as we expect them to work out. So an organization is a complex adaptive system, as we call it. It's constantly in movement. I mean, when you have a team, and you're a manager, manager of a team, and maybe you have an idea how you want to develop the team, it will never work out as you think it will work out. Because people take their own experiences to work. They interact together. Things from outside uh, will come into the team. Things from inside will go out to the team and will affect the team again. So it's constantly changing and adapting to the new situation. And you may look at nature, but also city, the internet, uh, bacteria, brains, all complex adaptive systems. There's not one part in your body that controls your whole body. Everything works together. The same with the bees. I mean, one bee can't do anything alone. He will die. But together, they're a very complex system. And they managed to survive for years. So, when you look at teams, at development, sit, uh, organizations, cities, it's, it's, it's complexity. And how can you deal with complexity? You cannot come up with a law we just discussed, because you cannot use numbers, you cannot use... Uh, instructions, you need to communicate, so we came up with eight guidelines. Eight guidelines that can help you to manage complexity, to deal with complexity. And I will discuss some of them. And it's important to realize that you cannot use one methodology, one system to manage all of it. You need to use diversity perspective. So when you're going to manage a city, a team, an organization, you should use different perspectives, different models, different theories not just one. When you look at nature, it's a great example. Uh, a lot of things are copied and adapt, but mostly adapt constantly. Nature is evolving, it's the evolution. You cannot come up with new solutions always. It's too expensive, it will take you too much energy. So a lot about dealing with complexity is about steal and tweak. Can you use something that is already today? Can you tweak it a bit and can you use it? That's how you can handle complexity. Eric Ries, in his book, The Lean Startup, uh, writes, the only way to win is to learn faster than anyone else. That's how you will survive. Also in nature, 
if you change the slope, you will extend. Look at the dinosaurs, but also software development teams. When I started doing Scrum in 2004, we had a release of 18 months, and then we started with Scrum, and we had to release every month. We thought that's craziness, We're releasing software every month. Nowadays, we expect companies to be able to deliver software a few times a day, because that will make you learn. So the faster you learn, the faster you can adapt, the faster you can change. <coughs> so the last one about complexity is keep all your options open. You cannot create one structure, one uh, plan that will solve everything. So keep your options open. Make multiple plans for the future. Prepare to be surprised, because it will surprise you. So the eight guidelines that we use for thinking, for handling complexities, are these ones. I discuss a few of them, but during the module, in the book, and also during the training, we discuss all of them in, in depth. How can you use them in your daily work? Because one of the things that Management 3.0 is about is being really practical, pragmatic. What can you use already tomorrow at work? Of course, things are based on theory, based on different books, but in the end, it's about what can you use tomorrow. And managing human people, humans, with frameworks, with models, is almost impossible. So keep it simple. You cannot control a behavior, you cannot control the internet, you cannot control a city, you cannot control organizations, but you can guide it, you can assist it, and you can facilitate it. This monster is called Marty, and he has the six branches that I just discussed, discussed. energize people, empower the teams, align constraints, develop competence, grow structure, and in the end, improve everything. And he will guide us during the training, during the workshops, through the different modules. The first one of us about energized people, based on different books, based also on Drive, probably known by so many people, Fish. And the thing to be discussed in the workout in the management training is about one to one, just a bit. Most of you, I hope, are already doing it, but do you also do it when you work distributed? Or do you always do it in the same room? Why not go out for a walk? Um, things that you can use as a happiness index to get an, an, an idea how happy people are, how energized they are. Do it a few times a day, a few times a week to get a feeling, to get an impression. And with all metrics, it's just the starting point of discussion. So what happened on May 12th, or March 12th, I mean? Why was this person suddenly down? What happened? Things that we discuss are Gallup's 12 questions. Do you know what is expected of you at work? Do you have the materials and equipment? And if somebody answers more than four or five questions no, you got an issue. You got something to discuss because something went wrong. We talk about how do you get to know your colleagues? If you have social networks, maybe some people it's a no-go. But you can learn a lot from your colleagues when you follow them on social networks or interact with them on social networks. Another way to energize people is to use kudo cards. I mean, when we have more and more teams working distributed and management sitting far, far away, what do you appreciate more? A compliment of a peer or a compliment of a manager? Kudo cards is about compliment, complimenting each other, peers who complement each other. You talk about the Champ Fox model. There are 10 motivators based on different books, and they can be intrinsic, intrinsic or both. And we talk about them. We talk about how they can give you insight. But we also talk about how they give you insight in your colleagues and your team members. Things, simple tools that can give you a lot of insight, also in the team. <coughs> One of the questions that I asked this week was about this situation. The team member is not performing after a change. Lunch, you have lunch with him, and the manager discovers what motivates the team member. And the manager now shares insight on the impact of the change on the unmotivated team member. So first he talks about what does motivate you, he finds out, and then he talks, okay, but if order is very important for you, and we now move to a scrum environment, you feel maybe less motivated because you experience less order. So is this good practice, bad practice? It's a very good practice because it gives you insight in the motivators. What is, this, what is important for this team member? And how does the change affect his motivators? Second module is about empowering teams. So you got the people in, energized. How do you make sure that teams are also energized, that they are empowered? 
You talk about four types of trust. If you talk about delegation, you need to trust your team members as a manager. But also the team members need to trust each other. The team members need to trust you. And you need to trust yourself. Can you stick to your values when it gets tough? We will talk about seven levels of delegation. Because delegation is not black and white. You can't say you're allowed to do this and that's not that you're allowed to do. You want to grow, you want to change things, be more dynamic. Dynamic. So we talk about these levels. How can you apply them in your daily work? How can you apply them in the team? Tell you as a manager, you will tell the team what to do. <coughs> Where seven is delegate. You don't care what they decide, it's up to them. And they're also symmetrical. So tell is the opposite of delegate. Consult, where you will ask the team for input and you make the decision in the end, is the, the opposite, opposite of advice, where you really give your input to the team and the team decides. And we we'll disagree, where you as a team and as a manager agree together. You can use this in delegation board to make things more explicit. And the nice thing is that a delegation board like this looks a bit like a Kanban or Scrum board, and you tend to move to the right to make your life as manager easier, to make everybody a manager. But it also gives the team the opportunity to move things back to the left, if they don't feel comfortable about it, if they don't have the knowledge. So it's really making things visible, and also giving the team and you, as a manager, the opportunity to move left or right. One of the things that I asked also this week was, the manager creates a digital plan to manage the team. And it includes even which task, hours allowed to work, etc., etc. We will they should communicate with them. Yeah, this is, of course, definitely an example of Manifest 1.0. I mean, the brain and the activity, the tasks are separated. So this is bad, because the team is not flexible, they can't do anything, because for every decision they have to make, they have to go back to the manager. The third one, align constraints. So you got the people motivated, you got the teams up and running, how do you make sure that they run in the same direction? How do you make sure that some resources are not over asked. So the questions that we talk about is how do we grow a great organization culture? Which three steps are involved? How do we create an environment that people are proud of? We talk about values. A lot of values. I'm not going to discuss them one by one because it's just two days training. But we're going to discuss how you can use those values to visualize things in your organization. That's step one. Pick your values. And the next step is to make it visible, to create culture books, handbooks. Because if people create a values book, it's so much more valuable, powerful than when an HR department will create them. You look at some great examples, from Zappos, for example. Uh, these are the 10 values for Zappos, created by the organization itself, not by a separate department. But the learning constraints is also about identity symbols. Definitely when you work distributed, you want to be part of a team, you want to be part of an organization. So we're going to talk about how do you give a team an organization? How do you make sure that the team grows as a team? Don't call them team one, two, three, or red, yellow, blue. We give them our own identity, because people want to be part of an identity. We look at objective key results, <coughs> used by many companies today, uh, because they can set direction, they can set a goal for the teams. Uh, we look at examples, but also look at how to implement them. An example could be like this, objective, launch an awesome, minimum, viable product. And then you describe some key results. How do you describe the key results? What should be the objective? What should be the key results? We're also going to talk about how you can measure them, and how you should measure them. I mean, if you always score 100% on your objective, it's too easy, and it's not challenging. If you score always around 20, 30%, that's demotivating, then you're making your life too difficult. <clears throat> Develop competence. People are very busy nowadays. I mean, we also have a lot of work on our plate. I mean, it's hard to find good people, so most organizations yeah, need to do the work with less people. But still, you want people to develop. One of the things I already mentioned was exploration days. It's, you can call it compared to hackathon days, hackathon days, but it's much more. It's about learning. You're going to give a prize to the team who learns, who shows what they learned. I mean, if you have a great framework and you're going to use, replace it with a new framework in those 24 hours, and everybody up, no, up front already knows it will work, what's the value of that? Or when you're going to try out a new framework, 
and nobody knows it, and it doesn't work, then you learn something. That's what our exploration days are about. Growth structure, already mentioned. How do you grow your team? How do you grow dis develop the distributed teams? <coughs> How do you make sure that knowledge is spread through the organization? Because if you got scrum teams or multifunctional teams, you got all the testers, all the developers, all the marketers spread out of the whole organization. How do you make sure that they still are able to grow their knowledge? You can set up business skills, organize people around topics, let them come together once a month, and not discuss the project progress, but discuss their business, the professional. We're going to look at visualization. How can you visualize an organization that you need to grow? We use the game metals for that. So you got teams, you got roles, and then we're going to take a look. How can you set it up? And yes, most people nowadays know that it needs to be uh, multifunctional teams. How are you going to set it up when you got multiple locations? You got a team in India, team in the US, and team in Europe. Are you going to hire all the testers in India or in Europe? What are the advantages? Are you going to have one Scrum Master in Europe? Or maybe two, one in Europe and one in India. We'll talk about it. We have experiences. And the last one is about improve everything. My favorite topic. How can you create an organization that's constantly improving, constantly changing, constantly adapting? One of the things that we're going to take a look at is the happiness grid, or the celebration grid, sorry. What do you, what do you celebrate? Sometimes people say you need to celebrate failure, because if you fail, you learn something. Is that really true? I mean, when you start up a distributed project and you decide not to communicate, then you will fail. And you could say that's a mistake. And I don't hope that you're going to celebrate that failure. But if you do it every day, every day you stand up with the project team, and sometimes it goes wrong, then hey, you're in quadrant F. You follow the good practice, and sometimes, yeah, bad luck. But experiments, that's what is interesting. Because studies show out that when an experiment, when you start an experiment and the outcome doesn't, uh, you cannot predict the outcome, people learn most. So it's about learning that you celebrate. We discussed this celebration grid, how you can apply it in your job. Look at change management, 3.0. And here we use, as I described also in how to handle complexity, we use four models, not just one, but four. Plan, do, check, act. The ability, knowledge, design, awareness, reinforcement model. The model with initiators and laggards. And the models with the five eyes, information, identity, incentives, infrastructure, institutions. We're going to discuss them in depth. But we're also going to discuss how you can apply them. One of the questions that I asked is about implementing 360 degree feedback. And you implement the system, a software system. And only the manager is allowed to see who gave feedback to whom, and not individual. How do you find this practice? Good, it secures confidentiality. Bad, it blocks transparency. Oh. Um, good, it gives management control on information. It's bad, it blocks transparency. Why is the manager to see more than you? Is the manager some kind of higher god or whatever that he is allowed to see more? Manager report all believes in transparency. We believe that everybody should be able to see everything. Of course, it should be protecting people, but then basically, if somebody gives 360 feedback, you should be able to see who it is. And you could wonder maybe, but what if he writes bad, and what if the guy can't handle the feedback? I think you got a different problem in your organization. And how you get the change, how do you do it? We're going to talk about the game the change agent, where we use cards to look about changes, to make sure that you covered all the things that you need to implement for implementing change. Because do you know, for example, when you try to implement a change what the group identity is? If you have a strong group identity, people want to be part of the group, and the change will be easier. But this is the Marty, the, the model. Energize people about getting people motivated, where you can use one-to-ones, you can use the 12 Gallup's questions. Can use the moving motivators to find out what their motivating are, motivators are. Empowering teams about uh, trust. How do you grow trust in a team? But also about the delegation cards, the delegation board, align constraints. We talk about objective key results, 
We talk about group identity, team identity, about values, develop competence. How do you develop competence? How do you develop a competence matrix? Grow structure. How do you grow structure within a huge organization? How do you set up communication? How can you stimulate communication? And in the end, how can you create a culture of improving everything? These are the six modules of Management 3.0. I know it was a very high pace, and I just touched a bit of it, as much more. You want to learn more about it, you can go to the management3.0.com website. They got a special section called Resource Hub, where you can read, read a lot about implementations. You can buy the book, of course. You could download the book, but you can't do it anymore, because there will be a new book this summer, Managing for Happiness. Uh, you can attend the workshop or training. I will be in India next week in Hyderabad. Maybe it's too short for you, but maybe again in September. Or you can just contact me and then we can see what you want to learn and how can I can help you. So far my presentation. I think it's now time for the Q&A. Yeah, Ralph, uh, thank you. And we do have some questions. Uh, let me uh, assign them to you because I need to assign through this interface. The first question I'm reading out, how to measure the happiness index? Uh, so this is the one question. Yeah, how to measure the happiness index? It's, it's pretty simple. You can do it different ways. You can just ask people to give a ranking on one to five, how happy you are. One that I really like is about using your hands. I mean, one, hey, I'm top, I'm totally okay. Five, stop, I'm not okay. And then the next step, you can I always believe in visualization. Just use a whiteboard, a flip chart, make dots on it, and just draw the line yourself. Don't make it very complex with software systems. Just use it very simple, with a visual flip chart, whiteboard, use your fingers, uh, and that's how you can measure the happiness index. And of course, it's always relative. I mean, it's about how you feel today, and maybe somebody will say, hey, I'm a three, while somebody else will say, same situation, I'm a one. But it's just to start the discussion. It's a metric, and a metric is always to start a discussion. Okay, uh, so we do have a second question, talking about how do you differentiate between an agile leader and a person following management 3.0? Or I could, uh, I could uh, rephrase the question is that, what is the difference between agile type of leadership and management 3.0? Um, good question. Um, I'm personally, I'm not that always interested in, 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 the, most in the naming and description. I think in the end, it's about what you accomplish. And an agile leadership can apply a lot of practices that I just described, an agile leader. I mean, you can use OKRs, you can use uh, happiness index, uh, a lot of things. So for me, it's not that a difference. I mean, it's a, managed people though, it's a collection of, of ideas, of frameworks, of tools. Some of the tools are very common, some of the tools are really related to managed people though. An agile leader for me is somebody who does the things that we described in managed people though. Okay. Uh, so we have some comment, Nippon used and Hero thing. So we do have, we are getting more questions. Uh, so is this already in practice in some organization as a whole? Uh, so the, the question that the asker is saying, I'm aware of a bit and pieces being applied in organization, but I'm asking as a whole framework to gather if yes, then can you share some, some examples? Uh, as a whole framework, a mandatory portal is not really a framework that you can implement. I had the discussion last uh, month also with some other facilitators. I mean, as I said, it's a collection of ideas, and I think there are many organizations already who implement a lot of those ideas, uh, but also ideas of other books. So when you look at the big companies like uh, Google, Netflix, Zappos, they implement a lot of things. Spotify, also a very good example. Uh, I don't think there's a one company that implements mandatory portal as a framework, because it's not intended for that. I mean, it's really a toolbox, and you should really pick up the things that you can use in your own company, your own organization. Because one of the complexity things was that you should use multiple views, multiple models to solve a solution. So if you only use Management 3.0, then basically you're again uh, in conflict with Management 3.0, where we think complexity should be solved. When you want to see some examples also of the, the, the different modules, you can look at the resource hub. You can also look at my uh, website, my blog, for Mentry A lot of examples about the different things that people implement, and how they are implemented. Okay, okay. Uh, the another question which I'm getting here is that uh, do we do you have some some advice tool 
for uh, measuring performance like uh, how do you measure the performance of individual or the team and do you provide some guidance for uh, salaries evaluation performance appraisal that part bonuses yeah. that part good question um, in a management report of my training and I didn't mention today we have a module about uh, salary formula where we look at how can you calculate the salary for most companies maybe it's a bridge too far but to think about it is very good we talk about merit money how can you distribute the bonus system without uh, the manager assigning things to the bonus to people but how can you do that as a team uh, how do you measure performance of individuals um, there are a lot of tools metrics about it the management 3.0 we got one module it's called uh, metrics uh, and we described 12 12 uh, rules for metrics, 12 guidelines. And what you can do is pick the happiness index, pick the sprint backlog, whatever, and compare it to those 12, 12 rules. Does it conflict? Does it not conflict? I mean, that's how you can use it. Uh, when you look at the happy value, or you can also send me uh, an email afterwards. I can give you some blogs about uh, metrics where you can use some uh, inspiration, get some inspiration about it. But management oh, doesn't believe in one system, one measurement, because it's, it's you cannot rank one person in one number. So you have to use a lot of different indicators. It can be about happiness index, it can be about how much bonus people will get, uh, and also when you implement kudo cards, it's some kind of reward for people. So it's a combination of many things. Okay, but, but it does address that part uh, uh, for the yes. organization. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the another question is coming is a change management 3.0. So how do we apply the four models? Uh, is it a situational model or an organization specific uh, thing? The change management 3.0. It's um, I can get the books up with my reach. Uh, it's an organization model where you, an in-depth model in the four models that I just described. We look at the environment, we look at individuals, we look at the team, and we look at the tools. So we cover all the things that you need to involve in change. And it's really something that you can apply for any change in organization, and you can just. In the training, we look at all the different um, parts, and you can just look at them when you're going to implement the change in your organization. Hey, did I think about communication? Did I think about how to reinforce things? Did I think about who will be the laggers? Who will be the initiators? There's a book about it, management, uh, how Change Management 3.0, How to Change the World, also from your upload, that also describes this in depth. Okay, uh, the another interesting question coming is is about the implementing management 3.0 from top down or a bottom up approach. The the, the asker is is uh, getting a feeling that uh, uh, it can only be implemented top down, because if if the top level support is is not there, we, we it's difficult to implement management 3.0 principles and practice in the organization. So what is your yeah. view on it? Very good question indeed. Um, Yes, it will, like, it will make it difficult or more difficult. But on the other hand, um, we talk about Kudu cards in Ministry Porto. A very good example where you, as a peer, reward other peers, your colleagues, your direct colleagues. That's not something that I think that you need to have permission for management. You can implement it. Where you can download the cards yourself, maybe you can order them from Amazon, and you can write with Kudu cards for other people. So then you already have implemented that part. I mean, implementing a seller formula, okay, that's complex. Implementing operation days, it will be challenging if you don't have support from management. But you can start doing things yourself. Uh, there's one topic about happiness uh, feedback door, happiness door. You can implement it. Uh, moving motivators that I just touch, uh, briefly touched. You can download the cards yourself and you can play the game. You can play the game with colleagues. So there are a lot of things that you can already implement yourself without having permission or support from management, high management. And maybe by doing that, Managers will notice that teams are more happier, that things are going better. And celebration grid about learning, you can apply it in a retrospective. You don't have permission for management to do it. So a lot of tools you can do on low level in your team already today without permission for management. And maybe then they will pick it up and maybe things will start rolling. Great, great. Uh... Uh, another question coming is that uh, how does it integrate with a scrum kind of framework? Uh, like if the teams are following scrum, can you put management 3.0 on, on top of it? Yes, definitely. Very good question. Thank you. It is a perfect match because a lot of management, middle management, uh, also project managers who implement scrum, the role will change. I mean, 
project management is not a role in Scrum. Or are you going to become a Scrum master? Or are you going to become a product owner? So what is going to do, what middle management going to do? And that's where management 3.0 kicks in. Because management 3.0 describes the things that the manager should do. You should create uh, energized people, you should empower the teams, help them empowering, align constraints, make sure that people develop competence, grow the structure because the organization will grow, and create a culture of improving everything. And of course in Scrum, you got a culture of improving everything, you got the retrospectives, every iteration, etc. But all those six modules that I just explained, that is what the role of the manager should be in a Scrum environment. Okay. Uh, so the another question coming in is that how uh, are, are you limiting the, the preview of management 3.0 in agile software development environment or it is a generic management philosophy which can be applied in any industry? So how do you look at it? Yeah. Thank you. The, the question again, uh, the last one. I mean for some reason, and I think it's also to do because you upload come from the agile world and as also as a software developer, is very strong, well known in software, agile community, but you can implement it in any organization. Uh, how many organizations, any organization that works with creative people, works with projects, can implement it. A bank, a university, a school, I mean it's limited by your own uh, mindset, but if you have an open mindset, you can implement it everywhere. Because the idea is that you give power to the people, uh, that you create a culture of communication, that you create networks within a company that work together, and I think that's applicable for any company. So okay. what we try to do at the moment is also to get it out of software development, to make it more public uh, also to other companies, uh, because it can also be applied over there. Okay, so uh, how do you see a role of a manager in scrum environment, in agile environment? We talk about manager should be a servant, leader and coach. Uh, like, but in, in management 3.0 it looks like more structured and managerial thing. So it, do you consider the coaching, mentoring and servant leadership as an important aspect for a management? Yes, definitely. That's always what I also told to my kids. Uh, I'm just trying to make sure that other people can do the work. I think that's the role of the manager, being a servant leader, being a facilitator, uh, and giving empowering people, make sure that other people can do their work. I mean, it's not you, you as a manager who should be responsible for the end product. You should make sure that your teams can do the work. And a lot of tools in Management 3.0, a lot of ideas, modules, uh, best practices help you doing that. They make you sure that you can give people more insight into what they like, if they're on the right spot on the team. You can help teams setting their goals for the next quarter so that they know where to go. So that's a perfect match. And I think as a manager, yes, you are a servant leader and you should help the teams. Okay. Now, uh, I, I want to touch about a bit controversial topic like scale agile framework is also becoming popular and many, many people are, are getting uh, answers to their organizational issue by following a scale agile framework. So, uh, do you see some alignment between the way a scale agile framework looks at the role of a management about making making uh, financial decisions, funding, and other stuff, and uh, the philosophy discussed in Management 3.0? I'm not an expert on scale agile frameworks. I have to say that. So, um, I think you can then they get more also in the organizations, and then I really recommend you the book of uh, Louis Frederic about reinventing organizations or the connected company. Um, Yes, as a manager and skilled as a framework, it can still go together, I think. I mean, the financial decisions have to be made somewhere. somewhere. I mean, with the delegation board, you can decide if you're going to do it as a manager, or you can say and agree. Why not use the knowledge of the team to make certain decisions? Where you can actually say, hey, we going to, I'm going to consult you, I want your input, but I will make the decision because it's my responsibility. But you can work together with that. It can implement and it can uh, enforce each other, definitely. Yeah, uh, so uh, many, many of these scaling framework and the agile leadership uh, philosophy is lean towards lean based of doing management. It's more about tool based, it's all about continuous improvement, looking at the waste, and they, they, they use the lean principles to guide the organizations. So how, how much management 3.0 is influenced by those lean principles and what kind of a contradiction or alignment you see in it? Uh, contradiction, I don't see directly, 
uh, influence. Uh, yes, I mean, Manager 2.0 is based also on many books. Uh, when you look at the top contents, we talk about also about uh, mastery, uh, the things that you also in Lean find important. But Lean is more, for me, it is a mindset definitely, but also more about the process, how you just set up things. Uh, Manager 2.0, I think it, again, uh, can contribute. Uh, it's definitely not a conflict with Lean, and it can enforce each other. I mean, if you have a lean environment, then still you need to describe what the world of the manager will be. What is he going to do? And I think then again you come to the six uh, modules of management 3.0, what describes what he can do. Okay, okay. Uh, another uh, question, uh, which looks like that uh, you you had a statement somewhere in the slide, which talks about that we want to have a fewer managers. So management 3.0 talks about uh, fewer managers. So why why that statement and why do you need few managers? Yeah. It's not said that we go five to go to five managers, but the idea behind is that uh, we believe that everybody should be able to be a manager. Everybody should take up responsibility of management. Uh, and theoretically, when everybody takes up responsibility of management, you need few managers. So that's the idea behind it. I mean, when everybody takes up responsibility of management, takes up responsibility of those six uh, branches that I just discussed in during the presentation, then you should, could use less managers. Um, that's, that's the idea behind it. Okay, okay. And uh, uh, do you talk about some level of, of checklist, uh, uh, more guidance, uh, some 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 more tools to support the implementation? Like uh, how how the implementation or transformation to management 3.0 happens in a near real world? It depends on company and organization. I mean, that's very hard to say. But it, I believe uh, personally in one percent improvement today, small steps. I don't believe in a big bang. You can't say to an organization, and today we're going to do management 3.0. I mean, it's Friday afternoon, 5 o'clock in the Netherlands almost, and now we're management 3.0. It doesn't work like that. Management 3.0 is a collection of tools and practices, and you should use tools and practices that are applicable for your organization at that moment. Uh, and then by doing that, by constantly looking at the tools that are management 3.0, reading about it, you can use things to improve your organization. But it will never be done, because it will always change. New insights, new things will pop up. So it's constantly evolving, constantly changing. And that's also what makes it so fun. Okay. So what I'm uh, I'm hearing is, or I'm interpreting is, the management 3.0 gives you a collection of tools and techniques, uh, games, which an organization can use and take some use of it. It doesn't limit the organization to those tools and technique only. If, if they see that something something else is needed in, in their context, could be a lean tool, could be a strategic tool, could be a business alignment tool, they pick up that as well, and finally they run the organization with a collection of, of these tools. Yeah, I'm now talking with a customer, uh, it's a huge company, a very corporate company, and they're really into management 3.0, in the mindset of, of having empowering teams, uh, management as facilitator, but they're in a corporate environment. But they got all those HR processes uh, in line. We got all those things they need to do. A lot of things, steps that they need to take because of the corporate environment. But still, this manager wants to introduce management 2.0, and the mindset, the ideas behind it in his team, in his department. So you can still do that, and then you have to be a bit flexible. Maybe you cannot implement everything you want. I mean, setting up a salary formula in a corporate environment, yeah, not done. Forget about it. But still, you can implement a lot of things. So you need to pick the things that you need, pick the tools, best practices. And create a mindset. Okay, great, great. Uh, and any closing comment you want to make based on the conversation which we had, uh, uh, because the questions will keep coming. And and the people who are putting up the questions, I recommend please tweet them out. Uh, you, we we have Ralph on on the Twitter, so he is quite active. So you can tag him if you follow Discuss Agile. You can see his handler as well. So you can continue the conversation over the Twitter or over the email. But I just wanted to ask Ralph that what do you get, what kind of sense you are getting based on the interaction which you had from our audience? Very good questions and the very questions that I recognize because how do you implement it, how do you start, I mean, that is the main difficult part. But I think the most important thing to realize, and that's maybe the closing, is that you don't need to wait for management. You can do a lot of things yourself. I mean, you can already start things proven around in your team, in your small team on a daily basis. So don't wait for management to start with it, but start small in your own organization, in your own team, and try to do the things that you can already do today. And try to make your workplace a happy workplace. 
Great, great. So that's that's the final closing. That try to make your workplace and happier workplace. Yes, just a little job. Thank you, friend. Thank you for joining in, and thank you, Ralph, for for introducing Management 3.0. I I'm sure that community got a lots of value, and get a different perspective about management. They 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 were introduced to. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much.